All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Liberty, and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. We're excited to host this discussion uh, about revolutionary queer theory and a new book from PM Press, Surviving the Future, Abolitionist Queer Strategies. Um, so Firestorm is a 15-year-old radical bookstore owned and operated by a queer feminist collective in Southern Appalachia on the land of the Cherokee people. We strive to feature book events uh, that reflect our interests and the needs of marginalized communities in the South. We're also committed to continuing to offer events like this one online uh, because we love reaching people at a distance. And I think tonight's a great example of that with our panelists. Um, but also because we know that COVID uh, prevents a, uh, provides a barrier to a lot of people um, uh, in our community uh, who are not able to access spaces like this in person. In the next month, uh, we're going to be hosting conversations on the ritual power of poetry and collective strategies for weathering state repression. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, I'd encourage you to check out our social media um, or our newsletter or the events calendar on our website. So for tonight, we are using Zoom's Q&A tool. Um, if you're on a laptop um, or a phone, it's probably somewhere at the bottom. <laughs> you can dig around and find it. Uh, we definitely want to hear from you. Uh, it's always really gratifying when the audience um, kind of like uh, becomes participant. So please definitely give us your questions as we, as we go, and we will um, be kind of reserving space at the end to really dig into those Q&A topics. Uh, if you're on Facebook and you're catching this as a stream, you can use the comment section uh, to post your questions. All right, so we're gonna get started here. Uh, tonight we're joined by editor Scott Branson and three contributors to Surviving the Future. And I'll just briefly introduce them. Uh, Scott is a queer, trans, anarchist writer, translator, um, community organizer, and teacher. Uh, they were an organizer for the UNC Asheville Davidson College Queer Studies Conference that inspired this book. They translated The Abolition of Prison and Gay Liberation After May 68, for which they wrote a critical introduction. Scott's the author of Practical Anarchism, a daily guide, which I swear we literally just did an event for like like a couple of weeks ago. So go watch that on our YouTube channel. It was a great conversation. Um, and Scott is currently working on a book on trans anarcho feminism. They often contribute to the final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist radio show and podcast. Uh, e. Ornelas is a PhD candidate, instructor at the University of Minnesota, and descendant of a survivor of the Sherman Institute, a native boarding school in Riversdale, California. E studies community-based abolitionist-informed responses to gendered, racialized, and colonial violence in Black and Indigenous speculative fiction. This re research has been published in the International Journal of Critical Indigenous Studies and Science Fiction Research uh, Association Review. E co-founded an autonomous Black and Pink chapter in Minneapolis and the Mutual Aid Twin Cities Housing Cooperative. Uh, Matilda Bernstein Sycamore is the author of The Freezer Door, a New York Times editor's choice and a finalist for the Penn Jean Stein Book Award. Uh, her latest anthology is Between Certain Death and a Possible Future, Queer Writing on Growing Up with the AIDS Crisis. And her next book, Touching the Art, will be published in November by Soft Skull Press. Yasmin Nair is a writer, academic, and activist She's an editor at large at Current Affairs on the editorial board of the Anarchist Review of Books, co founder of the Radical Queer Editorial Collective Against Equality, and the volunteer policy director of Gender Just. She currently uh, is working on her new book, Strange Love A History of Social Justice and Why It Needs to Die. Her writing can be found at yasminnair.com. <clears throat> So welcome everyone. This is like a really special and uh, fun event to get to do. Um, if anybody has uh, read the book yet, you'll know uh, that the, the backstory, which I believe Scott is going to get more of, does sort of start in uh, in our community here in Western North Carolina, which is very unusual uh, for any book. <laughs> 
um, that isn't, I don't know, regional fiction or something, um, but particularly unusual for a, a radical queer collection of essays. Um, so that is fantastic. And uh, also an opportunity for me to get to uh, kind of host an event with some authors who I really admire. So without further ado, I will pass it off to Scott. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Liberty, for uh, the introductions for all of us and for hosting, uh, for Firestorm hosting this event. I'm super excited to be here and talk with everyone. Um, as Liberty said, just like, you know, feel free to put questions as they come to you in the Q&A. And the way we're going to do is I'm going to talk for a little bit and then pass it to Matilda, Ian, Yasmin to read um, from their contributions, and then we'll get into a discussion. So we really do want to have, um, you know, encourage you to ask whatever questions come up. Um, this book is, it's really interesting the way I was thinking about how to set this up. Like I uh, moved to Asheville in 2016, where Firestorm is in this like location, and was working at the University of North Carolina at Asheville, where they have a history of doing a queer studies conference um, I think it had been maybe 20 years of history and they were looking for people to get involved. And I, I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. I'd come to Asheville, you know, a sort of change in my job situation, thinking I was going to like just live my life out in all the ways I wanted to in terms of like transitioning, but also just being very explicitly anarchist um, because like kind of navigating under wraps in academia beforehand was like making me miserable. Um so I was I was allowed to get onto this like this committee and then um, be one of the co-chairs of organizing it. And so I was like, I'm going to hijack this towards <laughs> radical organizing. And I, I was just thinking, like, you know, in this current moment where it's it's incredibly frightening, the explicit violence against trans people in particular and queer people in general, that's coming from the state, you know, over and above the um, the you know, constant attacks that people uh, have on the street. Um, you know, like I'm thinking about the different moments of making this book from the initial conferences, there were two of them, to the editing and the and the um, increase of contributions to now, there's like these different moments in sort of queer organizing that I was trying to think about like where we've come and how we got here. Um, in the initial moments I was feeling, you know, I mean, it was during the election um where donald trump got elected so there was a lot of like uh upset and anger but but the resistance that was coming out of that was very hopeful and it was you know really exciting to see trans and queer led um organizing um against trump but also you know in terms of like kind of ex increasing capacity for mutual aid and and Asheville was the place where i landed and that was like really um happening so coming to this conference and having a uh, a chance to organize an event at, hosted by a school with the school resources with the idea of bringing together activists and academics and artists, you know, a, a kind of meeting ground. I wanted to to think about how we could like use the resources we had to support um, people doing this kind of work. So we chose a, a theme of, of abolition, right, queer and trans uh, abolition movements. And, and I thought like at the time, this is something that was like really, you know, it'd been building over a decade or so and it was really coming to the fore. Um, and the the conference itself was just like a really special um, moment where like all of these people came onto this campus and there's a lot of like connections that were made. Like I met Eve for the first time there and we've con we've gone on to collaborate. Um, I've met a lot of like comrades that I've worked with from that. And I think a lot of other people made those connections. Um, that uh, I talk a lot about this in, in my introduction about how this also <laughs> led to the sort of uh, uh, unofficial ending of my career in academia, um, because I think uh, going out in this radical limb did put me into a vulnerable position where I could be um, sort of punished for it. And that's where Davidson College came in and people who had seen this conference and who did their own radical work and, and wanted to use their resources help uh, support me in, in doing another iteration of the conference. And this is like the second sort of moment that I'm thinking about in kind of queer organizing. So we had this like this sort of growing queer and trans led abolitionist movement. And for the second conference, we focused on the perils of inclusion, because I think at this time, like with the uh, visibility of trans, trans and queer organizing, but also the way that like post the, the quote unquote 
transgender tipping point in 2014, there was this kind of concerted effort on the media to have to sort of represent more trans and queer lives. There's like maybe a kind of false sense of security that was coming and we wanted to organize this conference to sort of question um, this, uh, this idea that we could like sort of be safe um, or that like there's this kind of progress narrative that's going to like wrap us into the, you know, the fabric of the United States in any way that fits. Um, and obviously we're living this out now. Um, the other moment before that though, before I get to now was like, you know, in the interim after these conferences that were like really exciting and, and had a, um, you know, kind of wonderful uh, ways of kind of bringing people together, the COVID, uh, pandemic sort of comes in and then the George Floyd uprisings. And it's during this time that we're starting to work on the book. Um, I had been, a PM press was just like, these conferences are cool. Do you want to do a book of, about it or, you know, bring, make this into a book? And I was like, yes, let's do this. Like bring in a lot of the contributors, but also bring in people, um, uh, other writers and thinkers and organizers to contribute to it, to like make this a kind of like a uh, varied collection. And the the this is in the spirit of the conference, which was like very inclusive that uh, one of the things I really liked about it is that you didn't have, uh, it's not like a whole bunch of like quote unquote academic experts, but um, people uh, like undergraduates, non-academics, um, incarcerated people, like we had all kinds of people uh, involved in, in, in presenting. And so I wanted that spirit to kind of infuse the book where we had a variety of voices, people who are like more seasoned writers and, and people who are publishing for the first time. Um, but as, as we were like putting this together, the, the pandemic hit. And so there's like this new kind of moment of like fear, but also like hope that, that the sort of explicit um, abandonment of the state for us would like bring spur on more organizing and, and more revolutionary action, which we saw happen, you know, not in a one-to-one -one causal way with the George Floyd uprising. Um, and so there's like another moment of like hope that like something could happen. Abolition comes, comes into the, the mainstream in a way. Um, but here we are as the book is coming out, right? After it's been a few years of working on this book and, and I've, I've just like, I, I don't know, it's, I'm very interested and excited to hear how people are receiving it because I've like gone through all these stages and we're in this moment now where whatever kind of, uh, feeling of progress that was happening seems to have, you know, the door slammed shut on it. Um, and there's like this kind of, um, fearful, uh, atmosphere because of the way, you know, the states, the, the United States is just piling on these anti-trans bills. We have this kind of so-called cult of, of, of feminism that's making its mission to target trans people. Um, this has become such like a, a talking point and organizing and rallying point of fear and, and creating a new moral panic. Um, and, and arguably like is narrowing our, our potential revolutionary horizons by making us like fight just to, to maintain a bare minimum of, of safety and livability um, by you know, going to the courts and, and advocating for like non-death dealing policies or trying to find politicians who aren't going to support this, right? This like is a kind of way to kill a movement. Um, are the multiple movements of, of queerness. Um, and this is all in a, in a wider atmosphere of fear of like the, that we see the disaster of capitalism wreaking havoc on the world. People are having a harder time just being able to survive, but we keep like going to work and doing these things. The targeting of the Stop Cop City movement, which uh, is another attempt, uh, a, like a bald face attempt of the state to target any kind of liberation movements. Um, even like these popular something that's as popular as a stop cop city movement. Um, so we sort of started with like this hope and this idea that we're like gaining ground. Uh, but I, I kind of feel like in this moment, there's like a real need to take stock of where we're at and uh, and kind of like reach out to each other, identify each other in different places and and start thinking like, what can we do to kind of take as I was trying to do with the, the institutions, take from institutions that we have access to and divert that into the kind of counter power uh, prefigurative projects that we can do. And this is something I see happening right now a lot with uh, different trans uh, grassroots groups across this, the United States where people are coordinating with each other to find, to, to like promote trans life and transition in the face of all these uh, attempts to take away the possibility of transition.
Um, so this is sort of my introduction to the book. The book itself, I, I want, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for people to read it and, and see that we've like cover so many different perspectives in this book. Uh, there's a whole variety of tone and, uh, and, um, you know, theoretical, political critiques, um, aesthetic uh, ideas, um, and like intergenerational learning. Um, so I think it, it just contains a lot of different possibilities in it. And so I'm, I'm very excited to have it out in the world and see what people make of it. Um, but I'm particularly excited to have these three contributors here to share from their work. And I'll, we'll use that as a kind of starting point for our, our uh, conversation afterwards. So I'm going to stop here. Um, and as you know, again, as you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we'll, and I'm looking forward to, to hearing from all of you. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Matilda now to um, read from what she wrote for the book. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming this evening. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, my piece in the book is about a very specific moment. Um, it takes place at the beginning of the pandemic, um, approximately April 2020 to October 2020. So it's a moment we're all very familiar with. In some ways, it feels like it was just the other day. And in some ways, it feels like it's impossible to imagine. So I want to go into the present of that moment. And I'm just going to read from just the first uh, one to two pages of the piece. Things that make me feel less lonely. I dream that I'm walking into a public square during some kind of street festival. And there are a bunch of styly punkish weirdos who are excited to see me. Maybe this is what I'm always looking for, a sudden home in someone else's eyes. And now we are here together. The sky is orange and red and everyone is flailing their arms. And so I join them. Someone leans his back against mine and we start dancing like that. Our bodies moving slowly around, arms up in the air and we're leaning against one another. Movement rolling over movement so we can fly. The feeling of his neck against mine, looking up at the sky for a moment and everything in my body says yes. Even though I know I'll smell like someone else's smoke and booze and sweat, I'm ready to make out as lips roll over neck, except then I remember the coronavirus. And I pull myself awake in fear before our lips meet. I try to get back to that space where my whole body comes alive in anticipation, but all I can sense is exhaustion. For those of us growing up, knowing that touch meant violence, that it could never be safe, that we would never be safe. I wonder about the long-term ramifications of this time when so many of us are avoiding touch for our safety and the safety of others. I've spent so long trying to find the physical intimacy in my life that I crave, the physical intimacy that feels like safety the safety I never experienced as a child. And leaving touch behind, especially in a time of fear, feels like going back to that traumatized place. Embodiment, for me, is a bridge between trauma and possibility. And it's harder to feel this without feeling it with other people. I just don't want touch to become impossible again. Hold me, wait, don't hold me. Do you see what I mean? I had no idea that I could hate this country even more than I did before. But then I'm screaming on my balcony at 8 p.m. the way we do. And I hear some guy yell, that's not how you do it. 
I can't see him. So I don't know if he's talking to me, but I yell, tell me how to do it, baby. He screams. I scream, he screams, I scream, he screams. Who says you can't have sex without touch? For those of us going without touching any other human being for this long, do we have a sense of what happens after? I mean, how to make it better, this touch when it returns? More intimate, more solid, more fluid, more constant, more evolved, more comfortable, more dependable, more present, more consistent, more expressive, more honest, more whole, more sensual, more supportive, more emotional, more grounded, more open. That feeling in my body that I don't have to hold everything in, that I don't have to hold everything on my own, that I can let go, that I can let the world in. This is what I've wanted for a long time. Wait, the police station in Minneapolis is burning and we are watching. And then we are in the streets too. Thank you, that's just the beginning of my piece. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to E. Thank you so much, that was beautiful. Um, Kia Ali, hello everyone. Uh, my name is E. Arnelas, um, you can just call me E. I prefer no pronouns, they them is also fine. Um, just as an accessibility measure, um, I hope everyone can hear me, but please like let um, folks know if you can't, and then I can put on a headset. Also, um, as a visual description, I'm a light-skinned brown person with um, a long black mullet with a um, streak of sort of a blondish uh, yellow down one side, and I'm wearing some hoop earrings with um, little red hearts on them, a white shirt that says Prison Abolitionist Trans Liberation, and um, behind me is a cream-colored wall. Um, I'm going to read um, some selections from the chapter that I wrote for this. It's called Telling Our Stories, Black and Indigenous Abolitionists, De-Narrativizing the Carceral State. And I'm going to do a little bit from the beginning and a little from the end, and hopefully it'll skip over most of the academic nonsense in the middle. <laughs> um, but if you're interested in what I have to say, you can obviously pick up the book and read the whole thing. Um, in Why Indigenous Literatures Matter, Daniel Heath Justice, a Cherokee author, considers stories to be of utmost importance for Indigenous peoples. Justice delineates between stories that wound and stories that heal, the former being the dominant settler colonial narratives told about Native and First Nations peoples on Turtle Island, that is North America. These stories, ranging from incomplete to downright toxic, are harmful. Quite likely any person, Indigenous or not, growing up on this continent could have called upon regurgitate these stories that wound. False images of brave explorers penetrating untouched virgin land, false images of thanks taking or more accurately, um, yeah, Thanksgiving or more accurately thanks taking meals involving happy patriarchal nuclear families of pilgrims and natives, young properly heterosexual indigenous cis women who fall in love with benevolent white cis men, the progress of Western, westward expansion bringing Christian sexual norms, primitive savages who antagonize settlers with deviant gender identities and expressions, or noble savages who are able to adapt and assimilate to Euro-American ideals. I argue that stories that wound are an integral part to the carceral state. These stories supply the justifications for how the carceral state purports to mete out justice and redress harm and excuse the violence inherent to it. My approach makes the case that Black feminist, queer, and trans theorizations of the slave state, as well as of indigenous, feminist, indigiqueer, and two-spirit critiques of the settler state are indispensable for more thorough and enriched queer and trans abolitionist conceptions of the carceral state. The development of the slave state and the settler state are not discrete meaning-making practices, but are concomitant parallel phenomena that culminate in the carceral state. Both are central to the creation of the US state as an othering and punishing apparatus. 
And as black as resistance, Zoe Samudzi and William C. Anderson cite the forced kidnapping, trade, and servitude of Africans alongside indigenous genocide as both, quote, intrinsic to American settlement, end quote. To demonstrate these intrinsic foundations, I, in this essay, um, provide an overview of the white supremacist settler colonialism that informs the carceral state today. Specifically, I discuss the othering narratives of certain bodies and lives, in particular those of Black and Indigenous individuals who identify as queer, transgender, gender nonconforming, and or two-spirit, which marks them as needing to be controlled through a myriad of punitive practices. In this chapter, I then present the how of carcerality and the carceral state, rather than which specific institutions, ideologies, and discourses have taken shape. So to give texture to this investigation into the how this has happened, I ask guiding questions like, how do othering narrative regimes inform the carceral state? How do these very narratives create the conditions of possibility for carcerality? How do they justify and bolster certain practices? How has this endured for centuries in particular, harming Black and Indigenous peoples deemed deviant and less than for their gender identities and sexual orientations. These questions are best answered through what Seneca Nation scholar Mishwana Goman calls remapping and unsettling settler narratives. Intervening into or unsettling the stories that wound requires a practice of digging into and exposing their roots and simultaneously emphasizing and affirming the importance of Indigenous peoples and people of color. Goman's practice of remapping and unsettling is helpful in articulating the conceptual resonances between dominant narratives of a slave, settled, or carceral state throughout the last 500 years. So skipping ahead, all of this is to say that stories matter, right? Stories have an impact. If the dominant ones told about Black, Indigenous, and people of color, communities have wounded and continue to wound, specifically by justifying the deadly punishment doled out by the carceral state, then any attempt to tear down and exist outside and in spite of these conditions must confront these stories. Overall, I see the stories told about Black and Indigenous peoples to be central to the carceral practices that need to be combated by us abolitionists. Conversely, the stories told by Black and Indigenous feminists, queer, trans, or nonconforming, and two-spirit people help to challenge policing, prisons, and punishment. I am in no way saying that to be black is the same as to be indigenous or vice versa, but what I am arguing is that to be either or both means that narratives that are not of our own making are foisted upon us. These narratives have formed parallel justifications and valences of othering as it pertains specifically to the carceral state. For instance, black and indigenous peoples are both overrepresented over in, incarcerated, in incarcerated populations. If these stories that wound precipitate these kinds of parallel effects, then it behooves those of us who are invested in prison abolition to investigate and counter them and to create our own. However, the narratives of the slave settler carceral state belie the continued existence, resistance, and survivance of Black and Indigenous lives that exceed the forces that seek to control, punish, and kill with impunity. We certainly need to tell our own stories of lives that have not been entirely determined by and indeed have forged sociality in spite of the restrictions and violences of the slave and settler carceral state. These are what Daniel Heath Justice might call stories that heal or alternative visions that speculate beyond the many harmful narrativizations that I lay out in this piece. At the same time, a dream of abolition from BIPOC communities must also counter these stories that wound, right, by denarrativizing the othering lives that the slave, settler, carceral state requires to define itself in relation to. Following the abolitionist and decolonial practices of Black and Indigenous feminist, queer, trans, gender nonconforming, and two-spirit theorizations of the slave, settler, carceral state, have attempted to remap and unsettle white supremacist, settler, colonial, cis-heteropatriarchal narratives by exposing them as the constructed fictions that they are. It is only by exposing and unsettling these narratives as centuries-long stories that wound, which prop up attempted attempts to dictate lived realities, that we can then see we are living in Christina Sharp's words, a past that is not past. We are living with the historical resonances in the present day, and we must do the work of denarrativizing them to resist retelling them. Katsukamati, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it along now. Hi, everyone. Um, I 
assume everyone can hear me all right. Uh, thank you so much again to everyone, uh, to Firestorm, to Scott, for everyone to, um, for arranging this event. And of course, this an incredible book. So what I'm going to read is a sort of extraction from my chapter, which is titled The End of Gay History, or This is Not the World We Asked For. And what I'm basically arguing is that gay marriage caused the suffering that we see uh, with, excuse me, <laughs> I was using the wrong glasses, um, that the gay marriage caused the suffering that we see with uh, COVID-19. So I'll just begin. Um, the problem with gay marriage, a movement that we have, I think, not theorized enough, the problem with gay marriage is not that it's a patriarchal, heteronormative institution. The problem with gay marriage is that it's a movement that led to other conservative gay movements like inclusion in the military and hate crimes legislation that in collusion with gay marriage allowed the last shreds of resistance to neoliberalism to be torn apart. Gay marriage led to the gentrification of AIDS, making the gay disease something that wealthy gay white men in particular could be protected from. Gay marriage led to the end of the last consistent movement for the institution of universal health care, a fight that continues to meet resistance even as millions suffer and die. Gay marriage, in short, led to the increase of suffering we see in the COVID-19 era. Let me state that as bluntly as possible. If gay marriage had never been won, if it had never been even a fight to begin with, and if the gay community at the time had continued after the quote unquote end of AIDS to take on other and more relevant issues, including the end of the prison industrial complex and the military expansion of the United States, we would not be where we are today. At the time of this writing, the country has seen over a million deaths and the number of infections hovers at around 90 million. Given the United States rudimentary healthcare system and its long-standing impulse to deny reality, these are both more than likely undercounts. And by the time this goes to print, both numbers will undoubtedly be undoubtedly be much higher. COVID-19 has demonstrated that the United States is not only the world's leader in deaths and infections, but that the supposedly richest country in the world has a healthcare system so broken that all we can do is stand back in shock and watch as the numbers escalate every day. All of this could have been prevented if we had healthcare freely available to all without the requirement of marriage or employment. It's not so much that the virus kills people, but that robust healthcare and other social systems could help keep them alive and get them back on their feet. Here in the US, the poorest were told to continue serving as fast food workers, delivery persons, and frontline workers without even the hope of tests at the time. Today, vaccines of course exist, but at the time of this writing, little is known about their long-term efficacy and effects. More importantly, the structural problems of distribution in the United States, now exposed as substandard, and the massive amounts of poverty, not just inequality, but actual gaping, festering poverty, will mean that COVID-19 will continue to blight millions while remaining something of no concern to the elites. How, you might ask, could gay marriage, that wonderful thing, possibly be responsible for all this? What might be the connection between AIDS and COVID-19? And for the chapter, in the chapter, I sort of go through this historical analysis of how all of that came to be. But I'll just skip ahead and go to the end -ish of the chapter. What if we had not suffered that depletion of political energy with the fight over HIV AIDS? What if the mainstream gay movement, now so large and ubiquitous that it is referred to as Gay Inc., had not swooped in and distorted that struggle? What if it had not turned the very fact that people were dying from a lack of health care into a reason to then deny health care to millions of others by demanding that it should be yoked to marriage? What if it had not thus reified the idea that it was perfect? okay to live in a world where employers should be the guarantors of health care. That moment when the idea of universal health care just slipped between the cracks and then disappeared from our radar until now has been severely under-theorized. Today, as this country deteriorates into a death spiral, that has not changed since the time of this writing, we are seeing things get worse and worse. Medical costs are the leading cause of bankruptcies in this country, 
it needs repeating. At the time of this writing, the United States, ostensibly the world's richest country, leads in COVID-19 deaths and infections. Medical care has never been so lacking and the bodies and infections are piling up. It never had to be this way. This was never the future we needed or wanted. This was never the world we asked for. Thank you. Well, thanks, Matilda, Ian, Yasmin, for sharing from your texts. Um, yeah, that was really wonderful. And I mean, I, I guess I wanted to take a few minutes just to see if anyone and any of you had any thoughts that you want to like respond to each other. Um, I saw like new connections among these as I heard them, like this kind of the idea of stories, like this, that uh, that the work of kind of racial capitalism and the state works through a certain kinds of storytelling and and Matilda is offering a kind of a uh, hopeful myth in the midst of of uh panic and Yasmin's like retelling a history to give us an uh, uh an understanding of a kind of critical story of, of how we got here um so that was like something that just came to mind but um yeah I want to throw it to you if if any of you want to respond to each other or pick up on anything Well, one thing I was noticing is <clears throat> all of our pieces are responding to a present moment that is um, no longer here, right? And yet it is continuing in different ways. Um, and one thing in particular I was thinking about um, with Yasmin's piece, it reminded me of, you know, when I was 19 and I, I was an act up, and I went to the March on Washington, the big gay March on Washington, 1993. And we had this, we had this idea we we're gonna have this mass um, uh, civil disobedience for universal health care. And we planned it all out. We were gonna, you know, uh, get arrested on the Capitol steps, which is very easy. You just cross a line and they arrest you. And we thought we would have like hundreds or maybe a thousand people. The march, there are a million people at this march. Um, and Instead, we, we had 41. That was all we had. <laughs> we did get arrested and we did, you know, go to jail and we did, you know, have a court, you know, date, et cetera. But obviously it was not a mass movement. And instead, the mass movement of that moment, 1993, was um, organizing for gay inclusion in the military. So you have like a million gay people in white t-shirts um, saying that we deserve, you know, to be part of um, you know, the most violent uh, institution in the world, you know, responsible for the most. So instead of something that would help everyone to live, universal health care, like Yasmin is pointing out, instead of that, it became, how do we kill? How do we prove ourselves? And I think, you know, Yasmin points to the sort of legacy of the AIDS crisis, and this is in the moment before there are any meaningful treatments before when people are dying, you know, within a year or two years, sometimes months. Um, and instead of fighting for people to stay alive, this, you know, gay movement in its moment of assimilation, because this is really the moment of the crossing moment, you know, when of, of, of that kind of assimilation into state tyranny, you know, state power into, you know, inclusion into the most, the dominant hypocritical institutions, starting in that moment with the military. And so it is just making, it's just bringing me back to that moment. <laughs> I don't want to go on too long. We can continue to talk about it. But, but I think that foundational um, hypocrisy mm -hmm. and the deaths, you know, Yadman's talking about the deaths from the COVID-19. And th in this moment, we're talking, you know, about the deaths, you know, Iraq, Afghanistan, on and on and on and on and on, right? And, and continuing to this day, of course. And I think, and to this day, right, of course, in that moment, I'll just continue a little more. In that moment, we're talking about gay inclusion in the military, right? This is 1993, 1994, 1995. Um, and then just recently, a few years ago, you know, now we're talking about trans inclusion into the military, which I mean, really, honestly, like anyone who I organized with, we would have said something like that as a satirical joke, right? It would, you know, because trans people even now don't even have a fraction of the power that gay people had in 1993, you know what I mean? Like not even a fraction. And so instead of talking about like, 
you know, how not to be killed just for being on the street, you know, how like not to have to leave your home or your school or your place of origin just to stay alive, how to get out of abusive families or, you know, how to survive on the streets. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, how do we go abroad and kill people and get away with it, right? And so it's that, that, that kind of tyranny and that hypocrisy that I think Yasmin is pointing to that, that I just think about this like the, this long view, right? And this is a short long view. I mean, this is the long view in my life. Of All course, right. it can go, you know, back further yeah. and it will go more into the this, you know, um, scary future that we're all uh, resisting in this moment. But I'll leave it at that. But those are the mo things I was yeah. just thinking about. <laughs> yeah. And if I may, I just I love that uh, you brought up that 93 March and that you brought up your own presence in it, uh, Matilda. That sort of makes me feel like I had a connective link to you, even though we did not know each other, I think, at the time, because I was in grad school and my friends and I, who were the sort of the queer contingent in our department, were watching the march and kind of also being horrified. And at the same time, I remember, I think that was the one where Larry Kramer got on CNN and said something about, you know, he was interviewed by one of those famous, uh, this is the time when CNN was actually a quote unquote big deal and Larry Kramer was on CNN that was a big deal to have a gay man with AIDS on CNN and I remember him saying that all of this was bullshit and it felt weirdly empowering at the time and but I also think thinking back on it now and thinking back on what you're giving us right which is this history and what he calls you know the stories right what are the stories we tell and how do we retell those stories and how do we return to those stories and actually complicate those stories? So I'm thinking about you, Matilda, in that march and me in my you know, room with, with my friends around me, all my queer friends at Purdue, when I know some of you out here from Purdue, you know, sitting there in 1993 and watching this kind of force of representation take over, right? And this idea that that was going to be the most powerful way in which queers could achieve something. But, you know, as you point out, you know, like what are the stories uh, that remain? What are the stories we need to revisit? Certainly Larry Kramer's story needs to be revisited, you know, as, um, but yeah, so thank you for that. Yeah, I'll also say, uh, I really appreciate both of, um, uh, yeah, both of your pieces and also like what you're saying, Matilda, about, um, you know, to me, what is like the myth of like the slave settler carceral state, right? That there is this myth of inclusion. There is this like, you know, that people have bought into this story. And so that narrative um, is exactly the kind of stuff that like, I, I do see as like the connective threads between some of our works. Um, you know, as long as people buy into and continue to like reproduce this story, this myth, this narrative that like, if we, you know, want it hard, bad enough, if we try hard enough, we'll like get inclusion. And like, we know that's not even, even if we did want that, which I don't, like that's still not even possible. So um, yeah, I think that's the kind of stuff that I, I um, wanna interrupt and I really appreciate um, everything y'all have said to like help do that interrupting of stories. Cause yeah, these are absolute myths um, and just recognizing that I think is maybe the first step and also then crafting our own stories that counter them. I think it's also interesting because like, you know, the, I, I work on uh, Guy Ockingham who, was part of the early gay liberation movement in France. And he already, like within a year of gay liberation as a movement starting was like, it's over, it's dead. It's it's fully exhausted itself in the act of coming out, which is this like force of representation and like the ways that these like, these tropes and storylines just like can take us over, right? Like even, even where you have the energy of a kind of radical liberatory movement, um, it can, just like fall into this narrative like we keep stepping into the same thing over and over again and that's why i see this moment right now with the anti-trans attack as a crossroads where we like maybe we can learn from the mistakes of gay liberation from the the abortion struggle right that we've seen like in this kind of glacial failure of 50 years or whatever um yeah i don't i this is a question of course i don't have the answer <laughs> um I saw that there was a question in the Q&A. Um, and so I, as maybe we can like weave some of these questions into our discussion. Um, this one was particularly for E. Um, do you have any advice? I'm going to read it it's from Finn. Uh, do you have any advice on how to uplift these healing stories without demanding a lot of labor from Black and Indigenous people? 
especially as a queer white person and there no the irony in the question <laughs> asking you that <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah i appreciate the recognition of that um yeah uh i have sorry i need to like also read it because yeah for me it's i'm not as good of an auditory learner um yeah advice on how to uplift more healing stories i mean I think part of why I wrote this uh, and wanted it to be included is just to continue to like speak back to the sorts of stories that we're so inundated with that are so entrenched in this country's like the, the fabric of like, uh, again, the slave settler carceral state that we don't, a, a lot of us, you know, born into the society and doctrinated into its lies, like we don't even realize it's the air we breathe um, that so many of these things are uh, the the narratives, the the lies, the myths about um, criminality, about punishment, about who's a deserving victim and an undeserving, you know, perpetrator of something. All of these are racialized. All of these are embedded within settler colonialism. Um, and so I think first and foremost, it is about trying to recognize every time that comes up, you know, like if you can sort of try to do that work to like unlearn these narratives and recognize when they come up and like have that little like you know, antenna go up every time you hear something and you think that doesn't seem quite right. That doesn't track. That is absolutely a story that has been made up and told over centuries until people believed it is true, but it is still a story that's been constructed. And I think, I think that's maybe like one of the first <laughs> forms of advice I would give is actually trying to write counter these stories that wound. In terms of uplifting the stories that heal, um, I think it really is about trying to um, figure out where you are in, in, in the world, in movements. I myself am an instructor, and so I try and, um, you know, prioritize um, queer and trans BIPOC authors in all that I do. Um, so no matter what kind of class I'm teaching, I always, that is like the baseline I'm starting from. And it is not as a supplement. It is not as a... Um, uh, a special, you know, a week on just like queer fiction or black feminist thought, it is the groundwork from which I am operating as an instructor. Um, and so I think wherever you are, whatever profession you do or whatever organizing you do, uh, you know, whatever, wherever you exist in the world, um, one, right, countering the narratives or like at least having that little like red flag that goes up every time you hear it and then at the same time countering it with these sorts of things that um you know aren't again supplemental but it is the groundwork from which like all of this is coming from i mean the, this resistance has been here for centuries right like this isn't something new um if we're talking about say like the um the ongoing not just the present moment um of uh the repression of gender expansiveness, uh, that's been happening for 500 years, right? So every time people bring that up, uh, just maybe slip that in there, remind yourself of that, remind others of that, that this is a move, this is like a moment that is just one of many moments um, to seek out and destroy other ways of living. Um, so I would just say, try to find where you can sort of like tap into those stories um, that heal wherever you're at. And, and sort of feed them back in every time you kind of encounter the ones that wound. Thanks, E. Um, you know, thinking about that and going sort of back to Matilda's question too, I, I thought maybe it would be interesting to have you all reflect on the title of this collection, which I think I, think I came up with. I don't even remember anymore <laughs> who, who came up with this, but you know, there's something provocative in it. I was, I was gesturing towards certain strands in queer theory, but I think there's like, it's open to interpretation and, and you all are kind of coming at it from different directions. So surviving the future, like, what does that even mean? I mean, it's interesting because I, I'm a huge fan of movies like The Terminator, which is all about the end of the world is here and we're all fucked and, you know, Walking Dead. We are, we're, I think we've always been, but we seem to be especially intensely right now in a moment where narratives around us convinced, you know, keep telling us, you know, it's all over, it's, it's done. And I think, you know, in terms of surviving the future, 
I've always t- thought that strategic pessimism was a good way to actually move on rather than thinking about, I know we use words like solidarity and so on, and I've organized, you know, not as long as many people here, but I've organized for about, you know, 20, 30 years at this point. And uh, I, I think the mistake we always make in terms of thinking about the future is a not to plan for the end of us, but also to assume that we have to, I don't know, you know, how do you survive the future is about how do you anticipate the future? How do you build a future uh, without relying on, for me, it's always been, and this comes back to stories, right? And narratives. How do we do this without relying on narratives about the humanness of human beings and the goodness of people and love not in the James Baldwin way, but love in this kind of, you know, icky, banal way that we've kind of used the term. And um, and I think thinking about it very strategically and thinking about it very forcefully and thinking about it in a sort of, um, I don't want to use the word weaponistic way, but really thinking about it in a sort of fierce strategic way is something I think is uh, dare I say, lacking right now, I think, in revolutionary ardor and revolutionary movements. Um, and that seems to be where we are right now in this kind of trap um, of feeling. Um, and who can blame us? Who can blame us? <laughs> Look how shitty the world is right now. I was just telling people before this began that I'm living, I live in Chicago and Chicago today has the world's worst air quality because of the fires in Canada. I'm nowhere near, well, maybe I, you know, but I'm not, you know, I'm not able to hop over the border. That's not how close I am, but here I am. Um, I didn't go out at all today. And if I open the windows, I can smell, smell the air rather differently. So how, who can blame us, you know, whether it's the environment or whether, I think for us in the US in particular, it is just the brokenness of the systems that we have to inhabit. Um, and I I understand the impulse to kind of gather together and to hold each other up. And I think that's necessary. But I also feel like there are other ways of being uh, the future that are required. I'll just leave it there because I'm repeating myself. Yeah, I think just building on that a little bit, I think one thing I think about is you know, often when you do, like, say you're listening to an interview with some, like, really scathing, like, leftist critic, um, they're talking about, you know, just tearing apart U.S. militarism or, you know, colonialism around the world or, you know, um, any some genocidal policies or, you know, some, anything. At the end of the interview, very often, the, ho- the person will say, so, what gives you hope, right? And so, for me, why the fuck would we be feeling hope, right? And so I feel like, you know, by saying surviving the future, we're rejecting the notion of false hope, right? Because false hope furthers systems of oppression, no matter what. Like, there's no point in false hope, in my opinion. And other than that, you know, and um, and so I and also feel like it, it, there's this notion that, um, we need to feel hopeful in order to go on living. And I think that's also not true, you know, and that's rejecting the realities of so many people. And actually I'm thinking about this conversation um, in um, uh, rehearsals for living um, between um, uh, Robin Maynard and Leanne Beta Samasoke Simpson. Uh, I hope I'm getting the names right. Um, And Leanne at the end says, um, she's talking about like her history as um, indigenous Anishinaabeg. And she's saying like, you know, her ancestors didn't like, they didn't continue living because of hope. (laughs) And she says, this quote I really remember, is she says, um, oh, the absence of hope is a beautiful catalyst. And I just love that. So I think I'll stop there. Oh, I love Leanne Simpson so much. Um, and that book is incredible and everyone should read it also. <laughs> um, yeah, that makes me think of uh, actually another indigenous scholar that I, I love and appreciate deeply, um, Kyle White, who uh, is Potawatomi and wrote this amazing um, article called uh, Science Fiction for the Anthropocene. And it's like the scathing critique of the term Anthropocene. And 
Um, in it, Kyle White is talking about how it's sort of like this, um, also a critique of this idea of, you know, that this, this future is like along some linear timeline, but actually like these things have already happened and they're happening and they will happen. Um, and Kyle White says, the hardships that many indigenous, that many non-indigenous people dread and fear most, like particularly they're talking about climate crisis and like the Anthropocene, right, are the ones that indigenous peoples have endured already due to different forms of colonialism, right? Ecosystem collapse, species loss, economic crash, <laughs> relocation, cultural disintegration, all this stuff. And so um, I think that's all, all of this, this critique is not just applicable to climate crisis, right? Um, I think apocalyptic conditions are settler colonialism, <laughs> are settler colonialist. Um, you know, these, these genocidal conditions that have sought to destroy bodies and minds, specifically through these like particular kinds of practices of incarceration, whether it's from the reservation, the boarding school, settlers have continued to try to, you know, keep children like my grandfather in Riverside, California in schools to, to assimilate and to remove any chance of a future, right, for indigenous peoples. Um, they've sought to destroy and yet have still failed. Um, and so I think about that as sort of this cyclical time or nonlinear time in the title. That's how I read it, um, is the surviving is this present tense or this gerundive tense of the verb, uh, even though, uh, you know, future always appears to us as if it's something on the horizon. So I just think about that kind of um, idea that we've already, all, we've always already been living in apocalyptic conditions and we've already been surviving the future. Yeah, I love all that you all had to say. Um, I think that's something I was thinking about too, that the, the future is sort of a threat, right? It's the future of the progress narrative. It's the future of the human and of society and the civilization that's created by settler colonialism and, and the capitalist state and is already here, right? And like, we need to find ways to survive it. I'm I'm very interested in thinking about like the ways that we we are doing that, right? That present, as Matilda brought out in the, previously um i see that there's a we've gotten a, a few questions um in the q a so maybe we can go to some of those um let me look through uh, liberty yeah, did so you i can i can jump in and pull some i mean there's a bunch of great questions here and i think some of them are bigger jumps from the current topic than others so i'll try and i'll try and move us into one that feels like a, like not quite as big of a jump and then we'll work our way deeper um so uh, Madeline um, is asking about the transformation uh, of oppressive systems um, and whether or not there's even a place for that with many of these systems. Uh, and the, the question says, uh, can revolution happen from within institutions as well as from without? Um, and I know you all have lots of thoughts on that. So that seems like a good one to touch on. Oh, I have a very short answer. No. <laughs> Because you always get co-opted. There's no possibility. It will never happen from within. But that's my short answer. I'm sure there's some longer one. I was just talking to a friend about, um, so I do pen pal writing work. I started an autonomous, uh, you know, black and pink chapter separate from like the um, national black and pink organization um, to do pen pal writing to folks who are incarcerated and LGBTQIA plus uh, and or HIV positive. Um, and, you know, I think one of the, the tensions we feel a lot of the time is, you know, are we working within a system that is like slowly killing people? Yes. And yet, like we are trying to extend some kind of sense of like connection and queer kinship to people while they are still trapped in those places. Um, and so I think, you know, while I agree with Matilda that the answer is like a resounding no, I also think there are ways that like, you know, maybe we can make some of these horrific conditions, um, you know, slightly less horrific. Will they change? No, they need to go away, right? Prisons shouldn't exist. Cages should not exist. Um, but people still exist in them, right, right now. And so I think there has to be maybe like a, a space um, for, you know, reaching out to folks um, through those bars and saying like, I see you and you you exist and you matter right now, um, even if we are also working towards getting you out from behind those bars uh, at the same time. Those things have to be um, happening at the same time. So yeah, 
say also a no. And yeah, I totally agree with that. And I think what, but what you're talking about, I think is, you know, reaching the people who are victims of those institutions, not say, for example, becoming the prison, like the prison warden and, you know, having a kinder, more just, you know, prison. So yeah, that, so I agree with that strategy as well. But I, I didn't mean to interrupt. interrupt. It looks no. like Jasmine has something to say. You know, I just wondered, you know, because I always think about the university, right? And as a writer, I'm always frustrated, for instance, by how many resources. And I live in and live near the University of Chicago, which is basically a prison uh, with massive resources. That's really what, and it has imprisoned the area around it um, in horrific ways through all kinds of strategies. But there are all these resources, you know, so for instance, the University of Chicago is a repository of one of the biggest uh, uh, archives of South Asian language and literature. But I can't access it, neither can many people who would like actually, not, not for reasons of wanting to feel their South Asian-ness, but just because people are historians and people are sociologists, you know, without being affiliated with universities. But no one can really access that, you know, without great difficulty. So for me, it is about, yes, institutions are, can be murderers, but how do we recirculate and reimagine those resources? How do we make it possible, for instance, for these incredible archives and for these the 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 magazines and the journals that, for instance, we have no access to the production of knowledge that's going on behind paywalls, where they pay tens of thousands of dollars, sometimes literally a year, and so on. So, I mean, I really want us to start thinking about gutting the universities. Um, ability to hoard resources I, you know that's it's a losing battle here in Hyde Park I'm afraid but I think there are still possibilities I just want those resources I want to be able to walk into those archives I love archives so that's 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 what I want is I want that stuff <laughs> I mean, I absolutely like, believe in like accessing the undercommons, right? Wherever you are at, whatever kind of institution you are at, your paid job, like, you know, uh, as like Moten and Harney say, oh, the no, only don't. relationship with the university should be a criminal one. And I'm like, any, any relationship to like these institutions should be a criminal one, like thieving that stuff away, mm -hmm. siphoning it away as long as they exist to, yeah, like you say, starve them out. Absolutely. Yeah, we st we can steal from them. And I mean, the the introduction I wrote is called betraying institutions. And I think like going back to what Matilda said about co-opting, like when we're involved in these systems, they they make they try to make us identify with them to like to find feel like we'll get our redemption through those systems. And and people can go into any of these positions like with like you know good intentions, but that reproduction of the, the system comes through the each individual who who ends up finding trying to find the solution through that system so like in academia there's like really cool people who who will get those resources and and make them available but going through the process of getting tenure breaks you into an academic right where you identify with the system and you think that you belong there and that you deserve everything that you've gotten through there and i think in terms of the state too it's just like since this is an abolitionist book like we can't the state only operates right like politicians and the police are are the same thing and it operates through that that force of 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 law and that violence and so there's no way to have this kind of like repurpose the state without without the police and without prisons it needs that to work um uh yeah i don't know do other people have other ideas before we move to another question Liberty, did you have one queued up for us? Yeah, well, the, okay, so there's actually two hot topic here, y'all. We've got two people who want to talk more about COVID, which is amazing because where I live, nobody wants to talk about COVID. Um, so these, these questions are actually very similar. Um, and I'll just read the first one that we got. Um, it's, uh, how do y'all understand the queer divestment from harm reduction in the face of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic? It's deeply confusing to me when I see queers apparently disinterested in community care when it comes to respiratory disease, especially when we collectively have a more steadfast politic around sexual health and wellness. Um, and then the, uh, the other person who asks about this asks in very similar terms um, uh, and asks about um, uh, what should we still, uh, 
mm, how do we convince people in our community that we're still living through a pandemic and that we should still be masking and taking other precautions to protect ourselves and the most marginalized among us, including incarcerated folks? So also kind of tying back into the question of prisons. I, I mean, I think this comes back also again, right, to E's point about what are the stories that are dominant and the dominant story right now is COVID is over. <laughs> I was just reading, I mean, New York always infuriates me every now and then I renew it just to see does it still anger me? And it does. Because again, in the most recent issue, it says something like, in COVID in the past, I'm like, no, there is no past to COVID. It's a throbbing present day phenomenon. So I think one issue is that um, I think in terms of queers, uh, in terms of abolition, in terms of COVID, and this is because I saw that there were some questions also around gay marriage um, and about how movements get co-opted. And, right, so a couple of people were asking about how do we prevent movements from being co-opted or being turned rightwards, and I think that's what is happening in a way. So I want to connect the gay marriage issue, you know, to COVID in that sense, and to think about how do we sustain that radical, critical impulse. I think the biggest problem around queer politics, and this is where I think this book is so useful. The biggest problem with queer politics is how it has become not unqueered, but untheoretical and unaware of how power works and where power resides. So queers, I think in particular, and I think in some ways abolitionists, have tended to think about all of these issues in terms of formations, movements around sort of individualistic harm. And I think there's a lot of the term harm has really become popular in recent years, which is important, right? When you talk about harm reduction, you talk about all of that, yes, but it's become very personalized. And I, I, I may be getting a little bit too abstract, but one of the things that concerns me around COVID is the ways in which I think we've been all persuaded to think that it's an individual problem. If, you know, also even, even the, you know, for unfortunately, even the question of masking, right? It's we mask to protect ourselves and to protect others. A friend of mine said to me a year ago when things were going to hell in a handbasket, he said, yeah, I knew that shit would never fly because Americans don't care about anyone. That's one issue, right? Which is, I think to I think we need to not think about the harm to ourselves and to others, but we need to think about systemically, what are we fucking up when we don't engage in protective measures? And I think that whole narrative around that story as it were the narrative about this is about me and you protecting each other has actually been the harm and it's been frustrating for me because I think what I always want to think about is okay what are the systems that brought COVID to us right and I'm not here to debate Wuhan or not that's not the issue here for me it is you know, and I think those are sort of legitimate queries, sure, but that's not even the problem for me. The problem is we got here because we've been getting here for many, many decades. So in that sense, COVID has always been around us, right? AIDS was always around us for a long time. And then it showed up because our systems were breaking down. What killed us wasn't the virus. What kills us always is a system make breakdown and the fact that we have no way to care for our people, which is why places like Vietnam are doing much better. And the United States, of course, cannot deal with that. Like, how is Vietnam? Do like, there, there are fewer people, you know, there's just much less damage in many ways. So, um, but I just want, I think, just thinking systemically, and I'm always thinking about power. Who has it? How does it make itself manifest? And how does it break down systems? Um, and to, I think in some ways, not stop, but to kind of perhaps de-emphasize the caring part, I'll, again, I'll just stop. Oh, I could, build, I'll, I'll continue from there. <laughs> Cause like, it's actually just hearing that first question actually brought tears to my eyes because it is something that I just feel like I'm living every day, this abandonment, right? And I feel like at the very beginning of the pandemic, there was this moment of possibility when across the board, across the board, and I don't know if I've ever seen this, honestly, from like the, you know, wealthiest 
like, you know, you know, just most privileged people to people who had nothing. People, it was all this rhetoric, and it's rhetoric, of course, but it was about caring for one another, right? It was brief, it was maybe two months, right? And, but it was a moment, it was like, what, you know? And I feel like, and also just that, say like the uh, poster that was very popular at that time, which is um, COVID is the virus, capitalism is the pandemic, right? So people are thinking structurally, right? And, um, and all, and so, but the moment that the structural abandonment started, which is of course the beginning, but they're like it, I feel like the structural abandonment um, corrupts everything, right? And it leaves everyone vulnerable. And then it becomes like what Yasmin's talking about, this hyper-individualized thing where not just that we're taking care of one another, which I don't think is necessarily a hyper-individualized thing, but like this idea, you take care of yourself, nothing else matters. And so, you know, Yasmin brought up, you know, um, HIV. And I think, you know, it took a long time in that case, it took like basically 15 to 20 years before there were meaningful treatments that actually extended people's lives, 15 to 20 years from acknowledging that there was an epidemic, right? Now with COVID, that happened fast, where people who had access to privilege, um, had access to say like, flying to, you know, Santa Fe and like, you know, moving into their casita and, you know, hiding out or like moving to Mexico City even, you know, people, you know, all moving all over the world because they can work from home. They don't have to be near anyone, you know, and, and then of course, furthering that same kind of gentrified mentality and, you know, but, but I feel like where, I guess there's that moment though, it haunts me. You know, the moment, that moment where the rhetoric of care mm -hmm. actually was at the center. And I do think there is a potential to that, mm -hmm. but it's also, it was squandered and it was squandered because of the structural abandonment. But I think there's also that question, and this is an unanswered question for me, because structural abandonment does not have to mean that we abandon one another. It does mean that that usually happens. It does mean that people don't have the possibilities, but I feel like if we, if we take a very small we, you know, the small we of like in this room that we're here now, like, you know, anarchist, queer, like kind of organizers, and there is more care still in those worlds, which is inspiring. You know, like I think um, at Firestorm, you still require masks if I, yeah. And I, and I think the only events that I go to in Seattle where masking is mandatory at this point are anarchist that's literally it's just a fact and i would not have predicted that to be honest but so there is something interesting there um yeah it's the only you know and uh, but we I, but love I masks like... we've always loved masks i don't understand <laughs> why you'd be confused <laughs> they're sexy as fuck <laughs> i mean i don't love them at all but i'm gonna wear them to take care of people you know right. uh, but i guess i just just to finish there i think i guess i i still i guess to come back to the 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 title of the book, right? Surviving the future. It's like in the, even in that moment, right? That moment of possibility um, when everyone was feeling vulnerable and where there was a possibility for something or to take another moment of possibility would be the protests, right? You know, which were in the midst yes. of the moment when everyone's feeling the most vulnerable. And yet people are in the streets every day because of that necessity. And then that moment, of course, you know, the retrenchment, the yes. police brutality, the like the destroying of those movements happened so fast too. So right. I think I'm just gonna leave it there because I'm I feel like I'm talking too much, but I feel like there's that simultaneous right. possibility and this and the structural abandonment, but then I think also the squandering of that possibility at a larger structural level that then impacts, makes everything hyper individualized and keeps everyone vulnerable permanently, you know, permanently. It's just, it is a real tragedy. Right. And this, you know, this reminds me of, of, the, of the most amazing sort of most radical queer organizing tactic around HIV AIDS, right? One of them at least was to say, instead of looking for who is infected and who is not, right? Who has, a, who, who, who is, who has HIV and who doesn't? Instead of doing that, the uh, strategy was to say, assume we are all infected, that we all carry it and therefore we're all responsible for each other, right? 
And, and again, you know, as Walking Dead fan up to season five, um, <laughs> you know, the idea that the virus lives in everyone. I mean, that's the whole thing about the Walking Dead. Big spoiler alert, sorry, but, you know, it is in everyone, right? Like it, it comes out of, anyway, you know what, but, but this idea of not is not looking for who's infected and who's not, who, you know, the question of testing and all of that is important. But if we assume that everyone has it or is vulnerable to it rather, right? Vulnerability to assume everyone's vulnerability uh, is I think the, the radical thing. And I think that's what the question was also sort of asking about, like, why did we forget that? Because the system doesn't want us to think that way. The system wants us to understand that, you know, Biden and Jill and Joe Biden will be fine. And if you want to be fine, you have to make your way up that capitalist ladder and get fine. I'll just, you know, sorry. I would just add like that, um, you know, I was, I was, did an interview recently for the final straw with um, a group in Missouri, the mid-Missouri trans folks who are working um, while this like emergency rule and these anti-trans bills were coming in. And they talked about in this emergency rule, they were, they were singling out how the language in this rule was um, looking at comorbidities with transness, like through autism, and um, mm. they have this idea of like social media addiction, depression, all these things, right? And they're talking about how this is like, like a place where we can have an intersectional kind of struggle of bringing in disability justice, right? That like, that transness here is being paired um, alongside other mm. forms of uh, that, where there's like points of lack of access to to care. Um, and I think like that, is really important to, to think about. I'm, I navigate the world with a chronic illness. And like, so like, I've been, you know, just thinking about this and, and thinking about like how there's so much social pressure because of everyone not masking. Right. And like, and it, we, we can individualize it and like moralize around it, but it, um, but that social pressure is like really hard to un undo. Like when I'm the only one masking in a room, I feel weird. Right. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's, that's like a real force. Like, I think there's just a lot of things that we haven't like fully acknowledged to that, like the isolation of COVID was damaging and there weren't ways that we were talking about making space together. And that was actually like feasible. Um, and we weren't acknowledging the needs in the same way, except in this kind of cavalier attitude, uh, right. Of like, I'm going to do whatever we want. Or like, you know, I'm okay. I'm not the one with the chronic illness. Like you have to go and like navigate the world with your like special needs, but I'm, I'm fine. And I'm going to just risk getting COVID um, because I'll be okay. Um, so I think like that, the, basically it's just like a disability justice issue. And, and like, I think this is why in this moment, again, I'm going to bring it up. Like, you know, we have the AIDS struggle, we have the abortion struggle, right? We have the trans care struggle right now and, and COVID. These are all access to to care, right? And these are all like disabling um, possibilities where the state creates the people who who um, have access and then and then disables other people. That's what the the abandonment is. Did you want to? Are you are you you feel good? Should we have one more question? I, I'm just like on on thinking about time. I know we're no, probably at the end of. We've got ten minutes, so um, yeah. I think we could. I think could one definitely. Okay. Yeah, one yeah, more for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if y'all have been looking. We do have, I think, a couple questions um, still in the queue. Um, there was one that Yasmin um, touched on briefly, just about um, strategies for resisting um, kind of like co-optation and neutralization of like radical queer movements. And this, the question was framed around um, gay marriage. But obviously, with everything we've talked about, I think we we could equally well think about it for all of these moments of rupture and conflict. Um, would that be one that people might have additional thoughts on? The kind of resistant resistance to co-optation. Yeah, and then the other question also, I think I'm just to connect it brings up the idea that Yasmin um, mentioned of strategic pessimism too, as like one of these. Mm -hmm ways to avoid co-optation um yeah and and well, looking for additional strategies i mean i and i think they were asking um you know to, just to reflect very quickly on this notion of strategic pessimism is to assume that yes the world is going to end the world is a horrible place and i'm putting it in very banal terms perhaps but essentially it's for whom do you want this future and it 
the future is not for you, right? So understanding that the, it's odd, right? To think about fighting for a future that may not happen, uh, <laughs> that maybe might all be obliterated or a future that you're not going to experience. I think that is a really critical, important thing to keep in mind with organizing, because I find that a lot of organizers actually tend to be in the mind frame of, well, this happened to me. I see this a lot uh, in my field of writing and publishing, where a lot of people will say, well, when I began publishing, I wasn't getting paid. So I don't see why I should have to agitate for anyone else. You know, I've said this a hundred million times. If you read my work, I write about this a lot. And my whole attitude is, you know what? I want a better world for the writers coming up and after me than I had when I started. That is joy for me, you know, so I think being pessimistic about human beings, being pessimistic about the future and still wanting a better future for everyone, uh, that I think is just so critical to keep an eye on. Yeah, absolutely. I, as I'm now like also trying to connect like the last question that I didn't answer, but I'm thinking about, right, like what you just said, I'm like, right, like for a lot of us and a lot of our like, ancestors and our our community now like imagining a future imagining a presence in some space and time as yet to come is liberatory right like that is something that has been denied actively um and so i think when i think about the previous question right like trying to <laughs> convince people uh you know who might have a hard time being convinced they need to care about others it's like well who whose liberation are you aligning yourself with right whose future existence um are you aligning yourself with um and then the other thing that what you just said yasmin made me think of is um the the future that i actually might not ever see right like you were talking about like working towards other people's better futures other people's like enriched lives and that is all of what I do. Like I am in service, like I am, I'm doing so much of this, not thinking I'm ever gonna see the fruits of my labor. I don't know if I believe I will see prison abolition and police abolition in my lifetime, but I have to believe it will happen eventually if I and others work towards it, right? Like we have to believe that people will be freed of cages if we work towards it. And so to me, like it's not, uh, yeah, it, it could be sort of a, a, a pessimistic approach, but I, I do think like we have to see like maybe a little more of the long game or something, or, or I don't know, I just have to do uh, do right in the world uh, and square myself in, 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 you know, uh, at the end of my life with that. Cause I don't know if I did nothing, I think I would just, um, yeah, I would feel like I was not aligning with a liberatory future that I want for, for myself and my kin in the future. I guess just to connect it to that question about gay marriage and co-optation, I think for me, the question really is, how do we always talk about basic needs for people who are the most vulnerable as a starting point? And the reason that gay marriage was able to co-opt was they pretended that's what they were talking about, right? So if we talk about housing, the right for everyone, right? To have housing and food and healthcare and the right to stay in this country or leave if you want to, you know, a sex life that matters, um, all of, you know, a support system, like all of these things, right? This is what we all need. So for me, I think it has to always come back to talking about those basic needs. And I think that's simultaneously how we change you know structures of power and take care of one another but i think it's also how we connect right because people always have this you know this ridiculous idea that connecting to like a larger to go to publishing right it'll be like larger audience or to like organizing it would be like middle america or like all these things and it's like so therefore you're supposed to like sabotage you know we can't talk about prison abolition we have to talk about prison reform but guess what people everywhere want prison abolition you know it's like we have to actually talk about what matters and that starts with basic needs but it also means our articulating and fighting for what we actually believe in not these like um this false notion of what is practical i love that just because like um I mean, I think about this a lot, right? Like the 
anarchism, this is the new thing I want to, I've been wanting to write about is like, there's something seductive in anarchism. And if we hide what we're really about, we can't get people to, we can't seduce people into, into like becoming, you know, criminals with us. And uh, I mean, anarchists and queers are very good at gatekeeping in the way that Yasmin was talking about, like, which is like, oh, well, I went through this, so you need to go through this. And you know, having the suspicion about anyone else having it easier. And, and that's something we can counteract in our own daily lives. I think that's important. Um, but like, you know, just kind of bringing this back together in, in, a, in a more general way, like, I think one of the ways that we keep getting caught is that like, we assume these goods as, as something worth fighting for, like, which is like humanity, the world, civilization, whatever, society. And and those are those are these like places that I think um, the power systems kind of creep in and and this like humanistic language that that uh, we like fit our 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 struggles into to try to gain more people onto you know onto our side and that just ends up diluting it more and more so um, I think like we need to be real about like yes we want to end this world maybe this world is ending right now in a way that's going to harm more people we want to end it in a way that's going to free more people rather than continue to harm them um maybe should we end there any final thoughts from anyone oh i think that's a brilliant place to end i want to say thanks for uh, editing this book i hope there's a little link so people can support firestorm in staying in business what by buying the book from the radical anarchist collective um and not from some other scary place you might go so i hope there's a link for everyone to jump on that right now um but um but yeah i want to thank everyone it's been such a fun um meaningful um intimate and uh wide-ranging and sometimes surprising conversation so i love it thank you everyone yeah, yeah, agreed. It has been a great conversation. And I will say, as wide ranging as it's been, the book covers so much more territory. Um, the range of voices is really incredible. And I hope that people will take the time to pick this one up and really spend spend some spend a few days with it. I mean, I think I think there's a lot to uh to find and be excited by here. So um thanks for teasing um some of uh some of the juicy bits. Uh and I do hope people will grab a copy from wherever, but from us if you want to. <laughs> Get it from Firestorm. Thank you for hosting us and thanks. I, I love being in conversation with all of you and thank you for all the questions too. Um, really appreciate it. And yeah, if you read the book and you want to reach out, I love to hear from people. So find me. All right, y'all have a great night. Thanks again.